And I find, because of my experience, I am I so despise the suicidal spirit, that suicidal, um, those suicidal temptations. I despise them. I feel like they're so deceptive, and they make themselves. They, it makes it sound so reasonable in the moment. It sounds like there's no other way. It sounds like it's honorable. It sounds like it's brave. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Lacey, welcome to Focus on the Family. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It is great to have you. You have a passion for people who don't know the Lord, mm -hmm. particularly those who, you know, the world might say are out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, that rock, heavy rock and roll world, heavy metal. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your childhood. What was going on for you and uh, what was driving some of those despair moments? Well, my mom um, f found herself in positions many times where she would need, you know, assistance or help, or she would just we would be in need, and um, and she when as she's trying to struggle to be strong and take care of everything needs to get taken care of, a lot of the authorities around us um, seem to not be helpful but to make things worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of grew up with this feeling outcasted in, in a lot of sense. Um, and I think the music was a really great way for us to, um, to find our own identity and creativity. And um, that was just, and I noticed that in a lot of poverty situations, like when I went to Rwanda with World Vision and I saw the kids there, they were dancing and singing yeah. and, and they were so creative. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, that heaviness actually pushes out creativity when we, um, when we use it as an outlet to deal with a lot of that yeah. weight. How do you, you say in the book that you wrote, The Reason, that you grew up poor. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up that way as well. How did that impact you, though? What did you feel not having the stuff other people had, other children? When you went to school, what was that like? Well, you just feel like you're not really part of a lot of the things that go on, you know? Um, you just, I kind of felt like, you know, getting bullied and made fun of for the clothes you wear or just being different, feeling a sense of rejection anyway. Mm. Um, you kind of want to just just be invisible when you're at school so nobody picks on you. You know, when you look at what's happening in schools today, that bullying factor, there's a lot of that going on. I mean, even in our own community here, we've had a number of teen suicides, mm -hmm. which uh, right at the school that my boys go to. Mm -hmm. And I'm having to have those discussions with my kids. And so often what they've observed is that these uh, young people are feeling that despair and they don't know where to go with it. That was you. You were feeling that sense of despair, mm -hmm. weren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, um, I talk about in my book how I had a tragedy happen and my family um, that I had. A, um, my, my mom's sister was a teen mom, and she had... She had her, didn't work out with her boyfriend, and they ended up living with us when she was pregnant. And she had her son and your he, cousin, my cousin, and he lived with us. And um, then when he was around three, she met a man. They moved to Houston and got married. And shortly after that, that man beat my cousin to death. So he was abusive anyway. We knew he was abusive at times with with my aunt, and we didn't know he was he would do something like that. And of course, when that happened. My mom had always talked to me about God, and um, and whenever that happened, she always said he would, God would take care of us, and I saw him provide for us along the way. Um, but when that happened, I remember thinking, I thought God was going to take care of us. Why didn't he take care of my cousin? Why is he dead and I'm alive? And, and you were about nine at the time, I, nine or ten? I was ten. Ten years old. And I and I, real, I kept, this thought kept asking, I kept thinking, why is he dead I'm alive? Why did it happen to him and not me? Um and how how can I honor his death? Like I wanted, and so I understand this now, and I even realized it as I wrote the book. I didn't realize it um, before that that it was a conscious decision I actually made. I didn't realize that I made this choice, and God actually helped me as I was praying when I was writing the book. Go back to that moment when I chose to stay sad for him. Uh -huh. um, so, like, 
um, so I so I kind of did this as a loyalty to his death. I, I decided I was going to stay sad for him, and I actually became distrustful of people who are happy. Um, how can you be happy in a world where children get beaten to death? Something's wrong with you. You know, you're yeah. either naive or something's wrong, you know. Yeah. And I... Um, you also kind of turned uh, your back on God, right? Yeah, it, I did it, not believe in God anymore. I felt like that was a broken chair people were telling me to sit in. This is not... I didn't feel like... And that made me angry when people would talk about God. And this is all from the time you're like 10 to 15, 16, right? Yes. I mean, that's early to contemplate such weighty and and heavy concepts. But well, you, I, you were seeing injustice in the world. Yeah. And feeling, um, you know, and the thing is, you're talking about that. Like, I would never assume that that wasn't a normal thing, a normal reaction for a ten year old. Huh. But people say that all the time. When I was there in the situation, it was so logical to just ask yourself, w- "Where's God? Yeah, He's supposed to protect us and care for us. You talk about God all the time being good. Well, why not he, Him taking care of?" us and then the same thing in a i would say she'll she'll like we're in a we're in a situation with six kids and we're really poor we share everything everybody's right. in the same you know if you don't you don't even like for me and maybe it's a mother mothering thing for me but i can't eat without thinking did you eat <laughs> you know what i mean right. it's just since i was little right i never was able to so when my cousin died i I can't think, well, he died, why am I not? And and I always thought about death. And I always wondered about about why, you know, how long we live. And how, how did resolution for that come about? Because you're young, again, thinking of these concepts of why your cousin died at the hands of his, uh, you know, your, your aunt's boyfriend mm-hmm. and, your husband. Al- mm-hmm. and husband, and you're already thinking that through mm-hmm. as a 10-year-old. You're rejecting God Mm -hmm. because you don't see justice in the world. And if God is real and alive, there should be some justice in this world. Mm -hmm. How did you come to um, kind of accept that bad things happen in this life? Well, I I guess I think that's what drew me to um, people who actually talked about it and people who actually dealt with it, whether good or bad, um, to... I wanted answers. I wanted to know truth about about those things. Um, I didn't have good resources, you know. Like when people were suspicious of of the jo- you know, the jovial kind of life, and you know, I I related to that, and I'm like, yeah, like why, you know? So you'd say, what's wrong with those people that are so happy? They're living a lie. Yes. In essence, yes, and you identified with sadness, and yes. in fact, you mentioned in your book the reason um, Kurt Cobain's death, and that was one that caught my attention. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it showed despair, mm-hmm. you know, what was going on in his life. Here's a guy, arguably, that was mm-hmm. at the top of his game in music and mm-hmm. had a lot of notoriety, and it was empty, mm-hmm. obviously, and that really resonated with you and where you were at. How old were you? when Kurt Cobain committed suicide? I was 12. But, and, you, and it made an impact on you, right? I, I went from our perspective as fans, I believe it was heroic. And now I understand how strange that sounds, um, that it could be heroic from an outside of that situation perspective. Um, and I know that a lot of, cult, like even the, there, there are cultures who consider suicide heroic. And I find, because of my experience, I am I so despise the suicidal spirit, that suicidal, um, those suicidal temptations. Yeah. I despise them. I feel like they're so deceptive, and they make themselves. They, it makes it sounds so reasonable in the moment. It sounds like there's no other way. It sounds like it's honorable. It sounds like it's brave, and um, and it. And I and I remember, there was an Instagram thing we went around, and my my friend Jordan wrote on her arm, "It's brave to live," because it's brave to live. And that's the thing is that a lot of people don't um, recognize that in those moments, if you make a choice to continue to live after you've decided that you don't want to live, 
you can do whatever you want with your life. Yeah. You can hand it over. You can, you can go on any kind of adventure. You can risk everything. You know, to, to look at that moment of not wanting to live and take it as a place of saying, well, let's do something different. Let's go a different direction. And, and say, you know, for me, the day I planned to commit suicide, having an, I know we're getting ahead, but having an encounter with God, I remember thinking when I let that guy pray for me, I was like, well, I'm just going to go die. Well, let's, let's talk about it because yeah. we're right at that point. This uh, despair, this path of despair right. that you were kind of meandering down because you, did, you despised happy people and joyful people. I'm mm -hmm. sure there weren't many committed Christians that were giving you the answers that you needed at that moment as a 12, 13-year-old. Um, but what, what was that allure to move into greater despair and even contemplate taking your own life and doing what you thought would be a brave act like Cobain right. and say, okay, I'm not enjoying this life. I'm going to end it. Well, with, Talk about what got you to that point. Well, with Nirvana, the message was they came out in a materialistic time in the 80s where everybody has the in and they're so flamboyant and, you know, and all of this kind of like expensive whatever. And they came out looking like homeless people. Right. Torn shirts. The whole right. Bit. And they actually identified with a homeless community. They like he was celebrated for having been homeless and living under a bridge. He had a, he had a song called Under the Bridge. And um, and so to 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 be celebrated as a poor person who wears those kind of clothes because that's from the thrift store and who gets made fun of because you have nothing all of a sudden now you have an identity and you're like yeah um, we have a voice here mm -hmm. and when he got into being famous you could see in his interviews the struggle he had with being famous and being notarized like everybody knowing him but him wanting to be an anybody and an everybody person and they kept exalting him and you could see the struggle in a sense in his interviews mm -hmm. and so when when we as fans what we perceived well what i perceived was that he was saying i'm i don't i don't want this like this i'm better than you right i'm above you um it's so but i don't know how to like let go of it it's like I'm stuck and sort of trapped in this. Um, it, but that was attractive to you. You were identifying with that because that was you. You were living yeah. in clothes you got from the thrift store. You were poor. Your dad wasn't in the picture. Yeah. And so you're identifying. How did you, um, again, now you're going to this church. How did you end up going to that church on that my, day where your life changed? Well, my grandmother had... Um, your, your grandmother. Yes. I, I was kicked out of my home for getting fights with my mom a lot. And police were called several times. And um, and I went lived with my grandmother in Mississippi. Um, that was the last resort for your mom. Let's put you with grandma and just well, see if she can straighten you out. Well, the police suggested that we find another place for me. Huh. And um, I'm it was glad. that in intense. Well, yeah, they were picking me up for running away and things like that, and um, and so they were like just asking, and I'm so thankful. You know, I always sort of viewed that police as the enemy because when we would get pulled over my mom wouldn't have the money to do an inspection sticker and then she'd have to pay that ticket and then we wouldn't have money for rent and then we would get evicted from her house and it was just this cycle of mm. watch out the police are coming don't you know there's all six of us shoved in a car on top of each other's laps which we have this tiny little car which is illegal and so he's like lay down the police are here and then of course they come and she gets in trouble and it's right. just never ends. So you always thought of them as the bad people. But whenever they show up, showed up at the house, and um, now that I look back and they're like, you know, maybe you, you should look at another place to stay. And I thought, wow, you know, we really needed that. Like, uh -huh. it was too so much. So you went to Grandma's. Now, how was that? When you showed up at Grandma's house, was she all loving? And it was relieving. It was. It, it, it was. It was so yeah. relieving to get out of the environment of uh, being stressful and just starting over is such a great feeling but you did have some conflict right I right mean, well i'm still struggling with all the things i struggle with but there's a relief in starting over you know yeah and so then um uh, you know i still am drawn to those people i'm hanging out and i'm trying to find ways you know we end up doing drug like being involved in drugs and uh just this these not not doing following the rules at home the way i'm supposed to um and I don't think it was necessarily vindictive. It was just as 
I had a hard time understanding sometimes. Just transitioning is hard anyway. And, and your identity was growing within that community, right? Yeah, well, that... I, I magnified any little thing in my mind that was rejection. Right. Anything that was a discipline, I magnified it in my mind and said, you know, just always thinking they they don't love me and mm. and um, I'm a burden to them. That was the biggest That's what you feeling. felt at that age. They don't love me and I'm a burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're that just, can be devastating to a child. Yeah. And you, you look at you them and you think, well, I feel like they wanted to do the right thing because they have to do the right thing. I didn't feel like I was a blessing to them, like I was a burden. Even, do, you, do you ever think about your behavior being a test of their love to say, will you love me even if I act this way? Have you <laughs> ever thought of that? Maybe subconsciously yeah. there was that. Will you still love me? In fact, you and your grandma had a bit of a shouting match, if I read that correctly yes. in your book. There was one day where the two of you verbally just went after each mm -hmm. other, and you were yelling, mm -hmm. and she started to yell back at you, mm -hmm. and she didn't stop for an hour. Yeah. What is it? I mean, literally just screaming? Yeah. Well, my hus my, her husband, my grandfather, was in the hospital, had had a heart attack earlier that week. And she was trying to tell me, you know, you're not obeying our rules. You're getting in trouble at school. You're doing things that are illegal. All of this is stressful. Your, father, your grandfather's in the hospital. He had a heart attack earlier this week. And you're not helping anything. Well, what she's trying to say is your actions affect more than just you. There's more people impacted by your your problems than just you. You can't, and that's actually good advice for somebody who's depressed to get them take their mind off themselves and focus on how they can help other people around them. But I was looking for a reason to end my life. And so I twisted her words from meaning, you know, from what she meant. We love you. You're impacting us because we love you. Um, to saying, our life would be better without you, which is not that's what, what you were feeling. This she is was what saying. I twisted the enemy, twisted that in my mind. Yeah. And, um, which was not true at all because there is no way it would have been less stressful if I had committed suicide on my family. Uh. It would have been more stressful. And but I found it to say life would be better without you. I'm going to take my life. I found a selfless reason. Uh. In that context, um, talk about though, she was going to outlast you in terms <laughs> of screaming, right? <laughs> I mean, that's yes. what caught my attention. You're yeah. kind of holding back here a little bit. Yeah. She was... She was determined to outscream you. You're screaming at her, and she just decided, okay, today's the day. I'm going to take you on toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You're going to church. And she then <laughs> said you're going to go to church. <laughs> Which was my punishment for skipping school that day. So what happened? She took you to church. She didn't even go in, did she? No, she couldn't because if she did, she would end up talking to people, and I could have gone out and ran away. Was this a church that she went to? Yeah. Okay, so she was regular, but she sat in the parking lot. She sat by the doors. And forced you to go in. In front of the doors. <laughs> Like, There's if you tactic, walk out John. that door, she's right there in the van. So you go in. What are you feeling when you walk into this church, feeling despair, feeling rejected, not feeling loved, and your grandmother is forcing you to go to church? What are you thinking when you walk in the door? I hate everybody. You hate everybody. <laughs> I hated everybody. I hated everybody, especially the pastor. And he was, and I also had this, you know, felt like I was an intellectual and was in Mississippi, and everybody to me is like, you know, they're not educated, which is not true. Just they just talk, you know, real life. <laughs> well, I really respect. You're feeling them like you, you know more than everybody else yes, around you. Exactly. But what happened in that church service that got your attention? Well, when he spoke, he began to um, talk about scenarios that he had been through that were just like I was the only person in the room, and like he was telling my story. What did he say? Well, he talked about different families and the struggles they went through. He talked about the kids, you know feeling isolated and having to take on more responsibility than they need. And he talked about how the violence that happens in those situations and how they become, you know, they feel alone, alone and misunderstood. He and talked about suicide. Someone... He stopped in the middle of all of that and just started crying. And that was really impactful to me because I never saw... To see someone be sad, I mean... To, to weep over someone they don't know and to weep over someone who despairing of life. Even just to seeing him weep resonated with me. Like, do you cry? Mm. Like, do you have pain in your life? Like, I will listen to you if I know that you can understand that that's how I feel, you wow. know? And so for him to weep 
stopped me and made me listen. And he doesn't know you're there, really, and what no, your issues he are. Know he's me just at speaking all. to the full audience. Yeah. And, and he's saying, I feel a heavy he, heart for somebody. He didn't say anything. He's just weeping. He stopped talking, just weeping. And everybody's listening. And some you can feel some people are embarrassed. And it's, it's uncomfortable. And he says, finally, he's wiping his tears. He says, there's a suicidal spirit in this room. He's wiping his tears. He says, he just says that. And it was just total silence. And everybody realized, you know, you're crying because you feel like a sense that there's somebody here who wants to take their life. And I was like, oh. You know, like, and that was you. Yes, it was me. And he's just wiping his tears and he says, please come up here and let us pray for you, whoever you are. God has a plan for your life. He doesn't want you to die tonight. And he's like wiping his tears. And the man, you know, I didn't go up there. I wouldn't. My pride wouldn't let me go. And can you imagine being him? I think about this now. He's passed away now. But how brave it is. To say that and have no one respond. Right, you think you failed. You think you just maybe you made something up in your head, maybe, who know, whatever. Right. He didn't care. He was. <laughs> but somebody caught you on the way out, right? Yeah, I went to What leave. happened? There's a man, I still talk to him. His name, we call him Poppy. Poppy. Yeah. So he caught you at the end of the service. He, and what did I he didn't say know to him, you? And he said, I feel like the Lord wants me to speak to you. And he had tears in his eyes, too. I think he knew. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. God knew. <laughs> doesn't matter if he knew, I guess. But he said, I feel like the Lord wants me to speak to you, and he wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. And when he said that, I thought, I don't need a dad. I don't need a, I don't need a man in my life. I had hated men. I, I mistrusted men, especially older men that were strangers. And he's looking at me. The first thing is that he looked at me with such love. Yeah. Like I never saw pure, no... Just love, love. In, in, in a strange mm -hmm. man's eyes, directed at me like he knew me. And, it, and I was like thinking, I don't need a dad. And, he, and then he, he spoke and he said, God has seen you when you cry yourself to sleep at night. And he, he said, you've been rehearsing your pain. There's been pain in your heart from your own sins and the sins of other people committed against you and your family. And, but I want you to know Jesus died on a cross to take the sins of the world on himself. So he took the effect of the sin. He took our pain so we don't have to carry it in us. <sighs> and he said, can I please pray for you? And ask Jesus to take the pain out of your heart. And I was just like, at that moment where I'm like, I'm either going to go die or I'm going to wait a minute and let this guy pray for me. And how can he know all these things? And I finally was like, this flicker of, of like, of receptiveness came. And a I was little like, spark. I was like, okay, you can pray. Why well, isn't that something? Praise God, huh? Yeah. I mean, that crack in the door. Well, your heart I, opened up. Well, I was such an out, a outspoken atheist, and I was like, unless I saw it for myself, I was not going to believe. And yeah. so I love that God is just, he knows what we need, and he's so kind. And it still took a choice for me to say, you know, I'm going to let you pray for me. Uh -huh. And so he put his hand on my shoulder, began to pray, and he said, God, I pray you wrap your arms around this girl that you created. And when he did that, I felt like God showed up right yeah. in front of me. And uh, Lacey, I think this is a good place to acknowledge that change, that beginning of the change. But I think people are going to benefit to hear more of your story and how God began to, uh, probably the best way to say it is just remove the gunk in your mm -hmm. life. Would that be fair? Yeah. And he began to change you. You didn't change overnight. You still had issues to deal with. I think so often people who have that transformation think tomorrow I'll wake up and everything will be right and I'll no longer be uh, captivated by those sins that have ensnared me. Mm -hmm. That's not typically what happens. In fact, what typically happens is it becomes more of a fight <laughs> that those things that ensnare you become even more difficult. Um, if we can, uh, let's come back next time and continue this discussion and talk about how God um, helped you along the journey, gave you a heart for the sinner, which I love, and we haven't been able to talk about that yet. Um, but I want to talk about why you continued then in rock music to reach people for the Lord in an environment most Christians would say, Ron! Don't go there. <laughs> yeah. But you're doing it, and I want to lift that up. Mm -hmm. Lacey, I can't wait to talk to you next time. Uh, I am excited to hear how God has worked in your life. Let's do it, huh? Yeah. Thank you. 
Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here, and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.